up, New Horizon? How are you doing this morning? That's awesome. So I was thinking about it this week, and where else can you go where, like, the first thing that happens, this guy asks you to sing? I don't th This place, this is where we ask you to do that. So if you're new around here and this is kind of weird to you, like, who is this guy? What, what's the deal? You're asking me to sing at 11 o'clock in the morning. That's cool. Just sit back and... Uh, Follow along on the screens. We got words up here, and just uh, I hope you find some hope and some strength out of the words that we're singing this morning. As for the rest of us, we're gonna sing out loud. So here we go. I believe every heart needs a healer, or someone to walk through the fire. All I need, and I have found, everyone is looking for a savior. When it feels like the world's going under All I need and I have found In my life, Jesus What are you, Jesus? You are the one, you are the one In every day, Jesus Every day is a hope to remember Yesterday's been washed in the water All I need in church. Just to clarify, I am not wearing 49ers red. It may or may not be out of respect for another team whose color is red, because that's probably the only joy I'm going to have this basketball season. If you're new around here, we're so glad you're here with us as we continue our series, No Limits. We're going to have a great time together. We're going to sing some more songs. Study God's Word, do some stuff like that. If you are new around here, you are a VIP. You're very important to us. We'd love to meet you at the VIP area, so we encourage you to stop by the VIP, VIP area on your way out. Just go out the doors and hang a left. You'll see a big green counter there. That's where you should step around and say hi to the VIP team. Let them welcome you, answer any questions you might have, and uh, just be there for you if you want to say hello. If you're online watching, welcome newhorizonchurch.tv. You can let us know that you're a VIP by clicking the Connect button there at the bottom of your screen. We'd love to know you're watching with us as well. Let's do this. We're going to continue to sing together. So those of you who decided to uh, have a seat, go ahead and stand back up. And, <laughs> and let, let, let's, uh, let's say hello to one another. But in honor of cold and flu season, let's do some holy fist bumps instead of handshakes. Amen. Right now, just a few fist bumps and then remain standing as we sing together.
vocalist Yvette is going to sing with you guys. So I'm going to sing a line, you sing with her. If you're watching online, you sing out loud too. Okay, here we go.
Have a seat. Mm. It's so good they were smoking up here. <laughs> Man, look at all you beautiful faces out there. And the rest of you too. It's good stuff. A <laughs> couple of things uh, I want to point out to your attention. If you have, are the parent of a teenager, or maybe you're a teenager and you're in here and you're not up in Revolution Student Ministries right now, at 12.30, so a little bit over an hour from now, is our first info session for summer camp this year. Uh, once again, we'll be heading out to summer camp with our students. And if you'd like for your student to go or you'd like more information on what's going to be going on and having some questions answered, the first info session is upstairs today at 1230. So what you would do is you'd head out the doors. If you've got little kids or whatever, pick them up. And then you'll go up the stairs in the lobby and go across the bridge there. And the revolution room is over here. And that's where the information session will be. And they'll answer any questions you have, give you a little basic information about what's coming up. I think in June is when summer camp is in June. So if you want more information on that, I encourage you to stop up in the revolution room at 12. 30 today. A couple other things I want to point out to you. In your seats when you came in was a bookmark that looks a lot like that. That's actually probably pretty big for a bookmark, but it would work, I guess. So uh, right there is our Acts reading plan. We're reading through the book of Acts throughout our No Limit series throughout January. So if you're kind of looking for a Bible reading plan, here's a good place to start. It's got every day's reading plan here. But a really cool thing I would encourage everyone to do is to go to this website here in the middle of the page. It's newhorizonchurch.tv slash daily dash devotional dash registration i know it's long but it works so use that and what you can do is sign up for our daily email devotionals and what will happen is around 6 a.m every morning you'll actually get the daily devotional with the bible reading in your inbox and right there from your email inbox you can kind of spend a little bit of time first thing focused on god they've been great devotionals we'll be continuing through the 27th so i encourage you to sign up there and anytime we do devotionals that's where you can get connected to uh, receive those devotionals also you may not know this but on the resource uh, shelves in the back every single week are these study and message guides, message and study guides. And it's just an auxiliary thing to help you take the message beyond Sunday into the rest of your week and utilize this to take notes on and you can mark down some key scriptures, but it's also some challenging questions. So if you don't grab these, I'd encourage you, they're always back there at the resource area. I encourage you to grab those 
as well. As we continue to worship together, we're going to worship by bringing our tithes and offerings. So if you need to get ready, maybe fill out an envelope or prepare a check or whatever, go ahead and do that. The welcome team will be coming around here in just a few moments and passing some buckets around. If you've already given online at newhorizonchurch.tv or maybe stop by the kiosk on the way in, thank you so much for your faithfulness, obedience, and giving electronically there. That helps us out. We appreciate that. But as you're getting ready, I wanted to share an update on our Christmas offering. If you were here in November and December, you heard us talk about our annual Christmas offering. And we had three main goals for our Christmas offering in 2013. Basically to uh, raise a little bit above and beyond our regular tithes and offerings so that we could invest more deeply in the next generation, our family ministries, invest more deeply in discipleship throughout the church, and invest more in the kingdom of God outside of New Horizon Church. And as of today, we got a little over $60,000 that came in through the Christmas offering. Yeah, you can apply that. And because of that over and above $60,000, we will be able to invest in the kingdom, invest in discipleship, and invest in the next generation. And we got some stuff in the works on the discipleship and next generation stuff, but we've already been able to make a dent in the invest in the kingdom part. In fact, one of the things we talked about right out of the gate was the thing we really wanted to do with that kingdom money is to go over to Central Elementary School where there were a group of kids who come in Monday through Friday and they, they get breakfast at school and they get lunch at school and that's maybe all they eat. So what happens on Saturday and Sunday when they're not coming to school? They get very little to eat, if anything. So we wanted to become backpack buddies with these students who needed it and fill up their backpacks with nutritious snacks, even some meals that maybe they could prepare themselves. And I'm uh, excited to say that as of this week, Pastor Leah, Community Care Pastor Leah, took the first implement, uh, the first supplies down. So we've already engaged in that process of becoming the backpack buddies with the students at Central Elementary School. And that's only because you guys were generous and because you guys prayed and asked God how he would have you participate. And you stepped up and you participated and we were able to go right down and engage in that. Another thing we talked about when they engaged in the investing in the kingdom was to uh, maybe partner with a few church planters, maybe locally, maybe nationally, maybe even internationally. And so what I'd like to do right now is introduce you to one of the church planters that we're looking at partnering with. And uh, some of you may know him, so I'm going to uh, welcome out Pastor Bob Robbins to join us on the stage here. <laughs> that was pretty good. It's, I didn't think Martha came with you. They, she didn't. I paid somebody to do you that. You paid somebody. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> now, so, I told him I, I told him I <laughs> I told them I'll buy their lunch. Oh, okay. Well, since we're, most Ta of us are Taco, fasting, that'll be Taco cheap. Bell. Well, yeah, bean burrito. Ch Taco Bell is about all we can eat right now. So, so he gotta, he'll sign autographs later, everybody. Let's, <laughs> let, us, let us get through the interview process. The reason why some of them are so excited is Bob was actually part of the New Horizons staff for about five years. In fact, Bob has an interesting story. His first day on the job at New Horizon Church was? September 11th. What year? 2001. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's Normally, a rough, I don't remember dates, but you can't forget that day. That was my first day in the office. Yeah, a rough day to start church, or maybe a really good day to start work in the church. But uh, Bob was with us for about five years, and Bob's been a church planner for a long time now and making a difference, making an impact. And you it makes are, me sound old. You, you are, uh, <laughs> at least older than me. But anyway. Um, and wiser. You're, you're, at, <laughs> you're at it again, aren't you? Oh, that, church yes. church planting thing. I thought we were at it. Yeah. yeah. You're at the church planting yes. thing again. Correct. Tell us a little bit about Correct. that. Correct. Yeah. Uh, my family and I moved to Austin uh, right before school started this year to plant a church in Austin. Um, and Austin. I, Texas. But I hesitate to say Texas because people have this preconceived idea about what Texas is like. And if you've never been to Austin, you assume that there's like a lot of churches and a lot of, you know, people carry these gigantic Bibles everywhere they go. Um, but Austin is not like Texas. I had no desire to live in Texas, uh, but Austin is way different. And so I don't want you to have this preconceived idea that there's a lot of churches there. The national average uh, for churches in America is uh, 12 churches per 10,000 people. In Austin, that averages 4.75 churches per 10,000 people. There's 150 people that move to Austin every day. Um, in order to keep 4.75 churches per 10,000 people, we would have to plant 24 churches every year in order to just keep 
at the pace that it's at now. Um, so there's a great need there, and uh, that's one of the reasons why we're there. And is there a, because Austin's a pretty big area, for those Correct. who aren't familiar. Uh, is there a specific part of Austin? Well, if you're unfamiliar with Austin, it would be difficult for me to describe. We can look at the map later, and I can show you. I'd be glad to talk to you about that. But it's more centrally located in Austin. We're not in downtown Austin, but we're just a little bit north of downtown Austin, so kind of centrally located. And what would you say uh, kind of describes the community, the area that you're in our, yeah, in our neighborhood, uh, using statistics, there are about 33,000 people that have no relationship with Jesus, no concept of Jesus. Um, it's an incredibly diverse part of the city. Um, you walk outside my apartment, and within five minutes, you'll probably hear five different languages spoken. Um, so it's an incredibly diverse place. Uh, this past semester, the University of Texas had 117 nations represented there. Um, so people from all over the world are moving to Austin. And so one of the things or our hopes and our desires is that, that if we can reach our city, then we ultimately can also be reaching the world because these people will not forever stay in Austin. They may go back to the countries where they came from. So we'll also be reaching the world. So that's another reason why we're there. How many of those languages do you speak? Unfortunately, I sort of speak English, and that's it. So Rosetta Stone could be a helpful thing I would thing love for you. Rosetta Stone, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so you're, you're planning a church that's about uh, 1,300 miles away from here. How can New Horizon Church as a church, and how can individuals sitting here listening to you uh, make a difference and make an impact and help you guys out? In yeah, Austin? actually there's a lot of significant things that you can do. Um, and one of those is to pray for us. There's no church that starts out that doesn't have a lot of people that pray for them. I mean, it's absolutely impossible 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 to be successful unless I have significant people praying and so one of the things I would like for you to consider doing you can do it uh, anytime you want or you can stop by and see me at a table at the back and I'll sign you up for our newsletter but if you just go to prayforaustin.com uh, you can sign up for a newsletter and you'll get prayer updates that sort of thing you can stop by there and uh, pick up a t-shirt if you want see this is what happens when you're a church planter you beg borrow steal hawk stuff you do whatever you got to do um, but if you want to do that and I would just love to talk to you a little bit about that uh, as you pray about that and one challenge that I would give you is maybe uh, to just pray about and consider maybe even this morning in this very moment someone is being prompted by God to be a missionary and move to Austin to help us. I know that would be a big deal. It would be a huge deal. And so I just want to ask you to maybe consider that. And so if that's you, I'd love to talk to you a little bit about that. And uh, we can pray about that together. Uh, so maybe consider that. And if you're not willing or able to move, maybe you know somebody who lives in Austin. I would love contacts. And so that would be great. All right, can we commit to praying for Austin and praying for Bob and his family as they uh, go out? Okay, we got seven. There we go. <laughs> I was going to say, well, that's seven more than we had before we started. So uh, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, I just uh, thank you for Bob and uh, Martha and DJ and Emmy and what their family has meant to the family of New Horizon for so many years. Uh, Lord, that uh, we can have an impact in a community that many of us will never step foot in. Lord, through Bob, I pray that uh, you would prompt us uh, on a daily basis to just lift them up. Lord, we pray for their family. We pray for a hedge of protection around them. Lord, as they do big work for you, the enemy will attack, and we pray that those attacks will be warded off, Lord, from uh, the, the prayer of mighty warriors who are sitting in this room. Lord, I pray for the hearts of people who might be uh, compelled to join Bob in his mission, to join his team, to join his plant team, and to make an impact. I pray for opportunities for Bob to speak to people and share the vision for what's going to go on in Austin and, and the changed lives that will happen in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord. I pray that you would continue to prompt New Horizon and every person in this room on how we could have a greater impact both in our community and around the world. And we just love you and thank you in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks. guys to stand and sing with us again. You may have heard Dave say that we're going to use this next song as our kind of a theme song for this series. It's called White Flag and it, it talks about surrender, but this is not a surrender of captivity or a surrender of defeat. This is a surrender that we get freedom in Christ. So uh, that's what we're going to sing about. It's called White Flag. Let's sing it together.
You guys can have a seat.
при бракосъчетанието на Богдана и Скор. How y'all doing this morning? Good to see y'all. Well, let's get it out of the way. State fans, let me have it. I only have one thing to say. I'm just glad it wasn't Carolina. <laughs> All right, grab your Bible, grab your mobile device, and turn to three scriptures this morning. Mark chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, and Luke 24. We're going to start in, Romans, or start in Mark 12, we'll go to Romans 12, and then we'll end up in Luke chapter 24. Uh, the video that you just saw there is known in YouTube world as a fail compilation video. It's a series of people going through unsuccessful life events. And for some of you today, you kind of sit there and watch something like this, and you're kind of thinking, that's kind of like my life. Kind of a metaphor for what's going on in my life, because I'm experiencing some serious failures right now. Maybe for some of you, it's in your marriage. You know, you started out years ago, you had high hopes and big plans and dreams for your marriage, but now when you look at your marriage, the word that flashes across the video screen of your mind is fail. Or maybe it's a, a financial thing that's going on with you. Maybe you're failing financially, and we talked a little bit about this last week. Maybe you bought some things you shouldn't have bought. Maybe you went into debt uh, way too far, and now you're just struggling to make it paycheck to paycheck to paycheck, and you're struggling financially, you're failing financially. Or maybe you would describe yourself as a spiritual failure today. If I ask you to describe your relationship with God, you may say things like, well, I feel distant from God, I feel disconnected, and I just feel like I'm failing spiritually. Well, the good news this morning is in part two of our series, No Limits, we're going to talk about that. And today I'm going to give you the single biggest, most important key to success in life. Does that sound cool? Yes. Anybody want that? Yes. All right. Now, before we do, let's just review what we talked about in this series. We started last week by asking a question. How many of you would like for this year to be the year where you grow more spiritually than you've ever grown before? How many of you would like to have that? We did this last week. Okay, same, same result, just almost everybody in the room. But here's what we said last week. It's great to have a desire to do that, but desire in and of itself will not get you there. You have to have discipline. You have to take steps of discipline in the direction of where you want to go and what you want to be. And that's what this series is all about. And it's based on a, a verse of Scripture from Mark chapter 12, something that Jesus said one day. A guy came to him and said, Jesus, of all the laws, of all the commandments that we have to follow, there's 618 of them, of all of them, which is the most important one? Here's how Jesus responded, Mark chapter 12, verse 30. This is our theme verse. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Jesus says the single most important thing that you and I can do is to love God, no limits. And how do we do that? By loving Him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. And we said last week those represent four steps that we need to take in the direction of being a fully devoted, a radically committed follower of Jesus Christ. And I, was, I said just a moment ago I was going to give you the single most important key to success in life. Can I give you that right now? Right out of the starting blocks? Okay, let's throw it up here on the screen see what it is. Read the Bible and do what it says. Last week we talked about loving God with all our heart. Today we're talking about loving Him with all our mind, and this is how you do it. You love God with all your mind by reading the Bible and doing what it says. Say that with me. Read the Bible and do what it says. Say it again. Read the Bible and do what it says. Now some of you are sitting there thinking about now, Dave, you worked all week and that's all you got? Read the Bible and do what it says? Is that the best you got? Actually, yes, it is. That's the best thing I can give you this morning. Read your Bible and do what it says. Now, you notice that statement is broken up into two categories, two parts. Read the Bible and do what it says. Because here's the deal. A lot of people read the Bible. A lot of people know information about the Bible. A lot of people know information from the Bible. But information in and of itself won't get you to the place you want to be. It takes application of the information to get you to the place of transformation. So think of that little equation. Information plus application equals transformation. You've got to have both, not just the information. Uh, let me illustrate this for you from, uh, for something, from something that's going on in my life right now. For about the last six or seven months, I've been dealing with a little back trouble called sciatica. Anybody ever had that besides me? Oh, a lot of you, yeah. It's painful, isn't it? It hurts. 
and it's kept me from working out in the gym like I normally do. And now I'm kind of back in the gym, and it's still keeping me from working out at full speed. So after the Christmas season, after the holiday season, when we all just eat ourselves into oblivion, you know what I'm talking about? I got on the scales, and I looked down, and I went, this is not good. I need to lose a few pounds after the holiday season and not being able to work out. So here's what I've got. I have information, okay? This is LL Cool J's Platinum 360 Diet and Lifestyle Book, okay? And there's some great information in here. It's got pictures of LL Cool J doing exercises, got workout routines, diet and nutrition information. I've got all the information I need right here. And you know what I've done with this book? I have read this book from cover to cover. I have the information. I know the information. Have I lost any weight yet? No. Here's the reason why. I have not gotten to the application stage yet. Information plus application equals transformation. Well, it works the same way with the Word of God, with the Bible. And that's what James says in James chapter 1, verse 22. Do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Read the Bible and do what it says. Jesus said it this way in John 14, 15. If you love me, you will obey what I command. Now, that's about as basic as it gets. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll do what I tell you to do. So here's what I'd like to do for the rest of our time together this morning. I'd like to talk about why we should read the Bible and do what it says. And I want to give you three simple reasons why this morning we, do, we should be doing that. Okay? We read the Bible and do what it says, number one, because in the Bible we discover God's will for our lives. It reveals God's will. You know, as a pastor, one of the things I've had to get used to over the years is people asking me lots and lots of questions. All kinds of questions. Questions about the Bible, questions about theology, Questions about life, marriage, relationships, when's Jesus coming back, all kinds of questions. But by far, the number one question that I get all, year to year is this question. How do I know God's will for my life? And usually it's in connection and conjunction with some kind of major life event or some kind of major decision that person's trying to make. Like, for example, you know, somebody comes to me and says, Dave, my company's going to give me a new job, but it means I have to relocate. How do I know if this is God's will? I mean, Dave, I've been dating him for six months, and he's about ready to pop the question. I can feel it coming, and he's a great guy and all that, but how do I know for sure this is God's will? I've been accepted by two schools, and they're both great schools. I don't know which one to go to. How do I know which one is God's will? How do I know God's will for my life? And if you've been around here any amount of time, you've heard me say this over and over and over again. God's will is contained in God's word. Let me say that again. God's will is contained in God's Word. So if you want to know God's will for your life, it starts right here with this book. Read the Bible and do what it says. But here's what's not going to happen. You're not going to crack open the Bible and go, Thou shalt marry him. Okay? Take job A, not job B. Go to that school. It doesn't work that way, does it? So what do I mean when I say God's will is contained in God's Word? If you want to know God's will, get into God's Word. How does that work? Well, think about it this way. How do you get to know somebody? Through listening to what they say and watching what they do. That's how you get to know somebody, isn't it? So this book here, this book is a record of God's Word and God's ways. Everything He says, everything He does. So as I read this book, here's what happens. I get to know God. I get to know Him through His Word and His ways. Through the things that he says and the things that he does. I get to know him. And the better I know God, the more I understand his will for my life. So the more I read this book, the more I understand God. And the more I understand God, the more I understand his will for my life. That's how God's will is contained in God's word. Let me illustrate this for you. How many married couples have I got in the house? Married couples. Come on, be, be proud. Hold it up high. Okay, all right, all right. How many of you have ever done this little game together? You're, it's church is over, you're getting in the car, and you're going to go out to eat, and you turn to each other and say, where do you want to go? <laughs> I don't care, where do you want to go? I don't care, where do you want to go? How many of you ever played that little game? Yeah. <laughs> Susan and I do it too. And here's, here's kind of how it goes with us. I turn to her and I say, where do you want to go? And she says, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. I don't care. And you know what? She really means it. There's no hidden agenda, no hidden meaning that I have to try to figure out. She really means, I don't care. Now, here's the reason why she can say, I don't care. She knows that I know her well enough that I'm not going to take her to a restaurant she doesn't like. 
She knows I'm not going to sit there and go, you don't care? Really? Great. Let's go to the doghouse. I feel like an old yeller today. Let's just go grab one. You know, a couple of hot dogs. That'll be good, honey. No, she knows I'm not going to do that. She knows I know her well enough that I know her will, and I'm going to take her someplace where she really wants to go. Well, it works the same way with God. The better I know God, the better I understand His will. So the more I read His, his Word, the more I get to know Him, and the more I understand His will for my life. Now, Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 12. So flip on over there, Romans chapter 12, and let's see what he has to say. Verse 1, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, so he's talking to us, Christians, Christ followers. I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So here's what he's saying. Make a radical commitment to following Jesus. Go all in. No limits. But there's a key phrase here that I want you to see in the first part of this verse, and this is really important for some of you. He says to do that in view of God's mercy. Radically commit to Jesus in view of God's mercy. In other words, because of God's love, not to get God's love, but because of God's love. Now, that's an important distinction for some of you this morning because here's where some of you are at right now. Your life is seriously jacked up, and you want to come to God. You want to come to God, you want to be a, a Christ follower, but you're thinking, I'm pretty sure God doesn't want anything to do with me right now. So here's what I need to do. I need to clean up this mess. Stop doing this, start doing that, do this better, don't do that different, you know. I, I need to get all cleaned up, then maybe God will accept me. Listen, listen, listen. Nothing could be further from the truth. You do not achieve God's love by what you do. You receive God's love through what Jesus Christ did. Did you hear that? Let me say it again. You do not achieve God's love through what you do. You receive God's love through what Jesus Christ did. So Paul says, Here, here's what you do. You, you be a radical, committed uh, follower of Jesus Christ because you've received God's love. And then look at what he says next, verse 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, Paul says three things here. I want to unpack this. First of all, he says, don't conform to the patterns of this world. Now, when he says this, he uses a particular Greek term that refers to the idea of being shaped into a mold or being squeezed into a mold. So here's literally what he's saying. Don't let the world mold you. Don't be shaped into the pattern of this world. Don't follow the patterns of this world. Don't be conformed to that. But instead, number two, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here's literally what he's saying. If I've got something on the outside that needs to change, where I need to focus is up here first. I need to change this first instead of focusing on this out here. And that's what we tend to do, isn't it? We tend to focus on the outer behavior. Stop this, start that, do this, do that, you know. But Paul says, look, here's the trick. You want to change the outer behavior? It starts in here. You change the way you think. You renew your mind. Now, what does it mean to renew your mind? Here's simply what it means. It means I take my thoughts and I replace them with God's thoughts. I take my words and replace them with God's words. I take my ways and replace them with God's ways. That's how I renew my mind. So I renew my mind. And when I do that, here's what, here's what happens next. Where am I at here? Hang on. Here's what happens next. Then you'll be able to test and prove what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. But here's what we tend to do so often. We get to this point, and we go, you know, I, I'm reading God's Word, I'm reading the Bible, you know, I, but, but there's something in here I, I just don't understand. I don't agree with this. There's something here that's not the way I think. It, it doesn't make sense to me, you know? So here's what that must mean. It doesn't apply to me. I mean, Dave, I know what the Bible says about marriage. But Dave, you got to understand, I married crazy, you know. You know? So this must not apply to me, right? Dave, I know what the Bible says about money, but I'm pretty sure God's never dealt with an economy like we're facing right now. So this doesn't apply to me. I read something I don't understand. I read something that doesn't line up with how I think, and I begin to think, that doesn't apply to me. And here's what I'm, in essence, here's what I'm saying. I'm going to do it my way because I'm smarter than God. I'm smarter than God. Yeah. Let me just say this. Okay, let me ask you a question. How many of you ever lost your car keys? Car keys? Okay. All right. Oh, yeah, a lot of us. How many of you have ever lost your cell phone? Yeah. 
You know, that's interesting to me. We have a whole box full of Bibles that people have left here. <laughs> Nobody ever calls about their lost Bible. But when somebody leaves a cell phone here, they're pounding on the door. They're calling, hey, I lost my cell phone. <laughs> okay? How many of you ever done this one? How many of you lost your car in the parking lot at the mall? And you're walking through the parking lot with your key in the air, you know, pressing that little button, trying to get the car alarm to go off. You done that one? Yeah. Okay, now think about this. You're smarter than God, but you can't find your car keys. You can't keep track of your phone. You can't even find your car, and you're smarter than God? Come on. I don't think so. We need to renew our mind. And when that happens, here's what happens next. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. The more I know God, the more I understand His will for my life. And when I understand His will, here's what I find about it. Three things. It's good. God's will and God's plan for your life is always good. It's always pleasing. In other words, it brings more satisfaction to your life than anything else you can think of. And it's always perfect. It's always at the right place at exactly the right time. It's always perfect. The reason I need to read God's Word and do what it says is simple. It reveals God's will to me. I get to know God, and I get to understand His will for my life. But then there's a second reason why we need to read the Bible and do what it says. It literally is the key to success. You know, if you and I were to get in the car this afternoon after church and drive over to Barnes & Noble, as we'd walk in, we would probably find two prominent displays of two kinds of books that are very popular at this time of the year. Diet and exercise nutrition books and self-help books. Y'all know what I mean by self-help books? Anybody ever bought a self-help book? Yeah, okay, me too. Here's what you find with self-help books. I don't care which one you pick up, they're all, they're all the same. They all say, basically, if you will follow our plan or our program, you can help yourself to succeed. You can fix whatever problem you've got. Now, I've only got one question. Who got you into the mess that you are in right now? You did. So in other words, you self-helped yourself into the jacked up state that you're in right now. You know what that means? You are probably not the best person to help you get out of the situation that you are in. Hello? But they all say the same thing, don't they? If you'll just follow our plan, you can fix yourself, you can be a success. Well, here's the deal. Success is not found in self-help books. The key to success is found in this book right here. Okay? One of the great Old Testament leaders is a guy named Joshua. Joshua got his start as an aide to Moses, and then when Moses died, he took over leadership and led the people of Israel into the Promised Land. And in Joshua chapter 1, he's getting ready to do that, and God gives him some last-minute advice. Joshua 1, verse 8. He says, Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Read your Bible. Do what it says. Then you will be successful. Now let's define success, okay? This comes from the Hebrew word. Let me sh show it up here on the screen. The Hebrew word sakal. Say that with me. Sakal. And you see what it means? To be wise or to be intelligent. So here's what God says. You read the Bible. You meditate on it, he says. And that doesn't mean you sit around in the lotus position staring at your navel going, Om. That's not meditation biblically. The word meditate in the Bible comes from a word in the Hebrew that means uh, for a cow to chew its cud. So you chew on the word. That's how you meditate on it. So you read it, you chew on the word, you do it, and the end result is you are sakal. You're wise. You're intelligent. You know what to do. You can make decisions that lead to success. And there's one thing I know about every single one of us here today. If you are unsuccessful right now in an area of your life, it's not because you're following God's word. I've never had anybody say to me, Dave, I started doing my marriage the Bible way, and it, it just blew up my marriage. Nobody's ever said to me, Dave, I started handling my money the way God says to in the Bible. I went broke. No, it doesn't happen that way, because when you read God's Word and do what it says, it leads to intelligence, wisdom, the kind of things that you need to make the right decisions so you can be a success. So why do I read the Bible and do what it says? Number one, because it reveals God's will. Number two, because it gives me wisdom so I can succeed. And number three, because it contains the power to change your life. Every single one of us at one time or another has been in a situation or in a place that we didn't want to be, and we wanted to get out of that place. Can you say dance recital? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? 
I mean, you go to the dance recital because you want to see your kid or your grandkid. You want to see them dance. But you got to sit through 50 million other kids to see your own kid dance. You know what? The last one I went to, five hours. Five stinking hours. I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, Jesus, get me out of here. Jesus, I'll double tithe. I'll be a missionary to Africa. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Get me out of here, Jesus. <laughs> Well, sometimes we feel that way, don't we? We're in a situation where we like to get out and we just kind of feel overwhelmed. Well, if that's you today or if that's ever been you in the past, let me show you how Jesus taught the Bible to two guys who were feeling overwhelmed by life. The story's found in Luke chapter 24. It's a story about two guys who were walking one day on the road to Emmaus. This happens three days after Jesus' crucifixion. So at this point, Jesus has risen from the dead, but these two guys don't know it. So they're walking along, they're talking, they're just trying to process all the events of the last couple of days. And all of a sudden, Jesus kind of shows up and he starts to walk with them and talk with them. Look at what happens, beginning with verse 15, Luke chapter 24. As they talked and discussed these things with each, with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. Now that's an interesting statement to me. Jesus walks up and starts talking with them, walking along beside them. And they don't even recognize who he is. They're in the midst of a dark, hopeless situation. And Jesus is with them right there, but they can't see Jesus for who he really is. And that's a great illustration for some of you this morning because that's exactly where you're at and it's what's going on in your life right now. You're in a situation that feels hopeless. You're in a situation that feels dark. And Jesus is there, but you're not recognizing him yet. Look at what happens next in verse 17. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? You know, you've got you to gotta think that Jesus kind of holds back a little smirk right there, don't you? Do I know what's been going on the last few days? Uh, yeah, I know what's been going on the last few days. But he doesn't do that, does he? Instead, he kind of plays along. He says, No, what's been going on? Tell me about it. So these guys begin to tell him the story. They say, you know what, there was this guy named Jesus, and he was a really cool guy. He was kind of like a prophet or something like that. In fact, we had begun to think that he was the one, the Messiah, the King of kings, Lord of lords, the Son of God that we've been waiting for all these years. But you know what happened to him? They killed him. They murdered him. They nailed him to a cross, and he died. Then they took his body and put it in a tomb, rolled a big rock in front of it. We saw it. We went to the funeral. He's dead. We wish he was alive but he's dead. Now at this point, Jesus does one of the coolest Bible studies in the entire Bible. Look at what he does. Jump down to verse 25. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. In other words, don't you guys believe the Bible? Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Jesus says, guys, let me, let me walk you through a little Bible study here. Let's start in Genesis. There I am, right there in Genesis. Oh, in Exodus, I'm there too. And, and Leviticus, that would be me. Numbers, I'm number one. Deuteronomy, guess who? And he just keeps going and going and going until the Bible says he goes through the entire Old Testament. He goes through all of the scriptures and ties them all back to himself. Listen, if you don't get anything else I say this morning about the Bible, get this one thought. This book is about one thing and one thing only. It's about Jesus. From cover to cover, it's about Jesus. The Old Testament predicts his coming. The New Testament reveals what he was like when he was here. The book of Revelation tells us what he's going to be like when he comes back in all of his glory. It's all about Jesus. He is the main character. He is the main theme. He's the superstar. He's the superhero. It's not about Abraham. It's not about Moses. It's not about David. It's not about the apostles. It's not about Paul. It's about Jesus. And let me say this as clearly as I know how this morning. That's what we're about here at New Horizon Church. We are about Jesus and his word. As your pastor, there is nothing more I want for you than for you to know Jesus, love Jesus, serve Jesus, follow Jesus, be radically committed to Jesus. And I want you to crack open this book and read it for yourself. And when you do, you know what you'll find? Yeah! <laughs> 
you will find the risen Lord. Look at verse 28. Yeah, verse 28, yeah. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Now here's how this works, guys. Those two guys saw Jesus arrested. They saw him put on trial. They saw him be convicted falsely. They saw him beaten and tortured. They watched as they took him to the place of crucifixion and they nailed him to a cross. They watched as he died over a six hour period. Excruciatingly long, painful death. They saw him take the body down. They saw them place the body in the tomb and roll a big rock in front of it. These two guys experienced a crucifixion. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think at this point they're feeling hopeless? Yeah. But then in steps Jesus. Into the midst of the darkness, into this time that is just one of the darkest times they've ever experienced. He steps into the middle of it. He cracks open God's word. He opens their eyes. And he reveals himself to them as the risen Christ. They experienced a crucifixion, but through the word of God, they experienced a resurrection. Now let me ask you a question. Here's how it comes back to us. Where do you need to experience a resurrection today? In your marriage? In your finances, your health? family relationship, job, work, career, school, health issues. Where is it that you need to experience a resurrection? Here's what you need to do. Read the Bible and do what it says. Because when you do, God will reveal His will to you. You'll find the wisdom and intelligence that you need to make successful decisions. And most of all, you will see the risen Christ. You'll meet Jesus there. Best thing I can tell you today, read your Bible and do what it says. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you today for your word. Thank you for how it reveals you, your will. Thank you for how it gives us wisdom to make decisions. And thank you most of all, Jesus, that it reveals you as the risen Christ. Jesus, I just pray right now for people across this room that you would help them to see that, help them to understand that. In the midst of their darkness, help them to see you, that you're walking with them, talking with them, that you're there to help them experience a resurrection. I pray for that in your holy name. Heads bowed, eyes closed for just a moment, please. Some of you here today are feeling overwhelmed by life. You're in the midst of a dark time right now. You're in the midst of a failure of some sort. And you need a resurrection. You need to know that Jesus is there. You need to see something change. And I would love to pray for you this morning before we dismiss. I'd love to take a moment and just pray for you, pray with you. But I need to know who I'm praying for. So just right now, nobody's looking but me. Would you just raise your hand as a way of saying, Dave, would you just pray for me? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, hands all over the room. Yeah. That's good, that's good. It's good to admit things like this, gang. All right, put your hands down. Let me pray for you. Jesus, I pray for every person who just raised their hand. I pray for every person who did not raise their hand but needed to right now. I just pray that you would help them to see right now that you are walking with them, walking beside them, you're talking to them, that you're there, that you're there to help them experience a resurrection. I ask you to build their faith, build their courage, build their strength. Help them to see you as they read your word and do what it says. Show them your will. Give them wisdom and intelligence to make successful decisions. Show them you're there, Jesus. I pray for that in your holy name. 
heads bowed, eyes closed for just a moment longer. For some of you today, you've never received Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior. Or maybe you're not sure if you've done that. Or you did it a long time ago, but you've been running away from God. Here's what the Bible says to you. Jesus Christ came into this world for you. He came here to live a sinless life and to go to the cross to pay the price for your sins. He died on that cross and three days later rose from the dead so that you and I could enjoy eternal life with Him. Now here's what the Bible says, Romans 10, 9. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. If you need to do that today, if you need Jesus, you need Jesus to forgive your sins, if you need to know that you're headed for heaven when you die, I want you to pray with me right now, just in your heart, in your mind. You don't have to pray it out loud. But just pray something like this. Just, just say, Jesus, just talk to him in your heart. He's here. He, he hears what you say. Jesus, I am a sinner. I need to be saved. Would you forgive me of my sin? Come into my heart. Come into my life. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and rose from the dead so that I could be saved today. And today I confess you as my Lord. I surrender to you everything I have, everything I am. You are Lord. You are my God. You are my King. You are my Savior. Help me to be all that you created me to be. Show me how to live for you. And I pray for that in your holy name. Amen. Now everybody look up at me. A couple things I want you to do. If you just prayed that prayer with me, I want you to stop by the back area right over here. We call it the prayer and care area. There are friendly folks there to help you out, and they would love to give you one of these if you just prayed with us. It's a getting started kit, help you get started in your relationship with Jesus. It contains a free Bible along with helpful information that will just kind of get you off on the right foot in your new relationship with Jesus. No strings attached, just stop by and pick one up, okay? Now, you have Bible reading guides in your seat, right? The Acts Bible study, I know Jamie already talked about this, but let's just hit it one more time. Read your Bible and do what it says, okay? If you need to get started on this, uh, this is a great way to start. You can, uh, there's catch-up devotionals and all kinds of stuff on here. I don't even know what's all on here, but read it and, and then go home and read your Bible and do what it says, okay? Gang, I love you. Hope you'll be back next week. Next week, part three, we're going to be talking about how to love God with all your strength. And I'm going to share with you a, an incredibly cool Bible story that you've probably never heard before. Okay? See you next week, guys. Love you.